thought when it comes to Lent. Oh, man. Lent just crept up on us. And I find that such a funny saying, that Lent just crept up on us. We just had Jonah's fast two weeks ago. It's been two weeks before Lent I, for the last thousand years in the Coptic Church. I'm not, okay, 1,050 to be a little bit more exact. It should not have crept up upon us. We know that it's coming. Maybe we just don't want it to come. And we know that it's here. Who is excited? Why aren't we all excited about Lent? This time of the year, including Holy Week, has, in my mind, the greatest potential to dramatically change our lives in a good way, in a good way. This is the time that lives are changed and saints are made. In this time, Satan's hold over many aspects of our lives is broken, is crushed, and a relationship with our unbelievable, amazing, loving God is built and restored. I want to ask you, what time of the year has a better chance to do this than Lent? Do you want to claim that the Holy 50 Days is when you get your spiritual high? Absolutely not. This is the time. If you want to grow spiritually, this is the time. We get eight weeks of absolute Christ-centeredness. We focus on Jesus Christ and Him more importantly than anything else. We focus on Him in our liturgies, in our readings, in our constant prayers. We're reminded of His fast, His fast that was for us, but we're constantly reminded of His willingness throughout the readings to receive a prodigal son, to receive an adulterous woman who was humiliated and never satisfied, to receive someone who lived in darkness their entire lives. We're constantly focused on his willingness and desire to draw us close. And of course, we can never forget his sufferings. I'm going to read to you some verses in Isaiah 53. You guys know Isaiah 53 is the key chapter in the Old Testament that we read on Good Friday describing the sufferings of Christ 700 years before he suffered. It says, He has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. We like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. He was led as a, slam, as a lamb to the slaughter. If the focus on a selfless, self-sacrificing, loving, incredible God can't move you to desire him more, if not now, when? with all this focus on Him and what He's done for us, if this doesn't draw us closer to Him, what time of the year will? Why don't we want it? Why are we so afraid of Lent? I'm going to tell you. Don't hate me more than you already do. But an addict always worries when you take away the drug that has enslaved them. Whether it be alcohol, meth, cocaine, when you take it away, they're afraid. They don't want it, even though they know that it'll be good for them to take it away from them, they still don't want you to take it away. They're going to tell you they're fine. They're going to deny that there is even a problem. They're going to say, I'm in control. It's not an issue. And they're really in fear. So then you're saying, Mark, why are you bringing up addiction? Forgive me. I'm not trying to point to others. This is very much for me. But we have a fear of giving up our food addictions. We're so dependent on lots of delicious food all the time. We eat when we're hungry, and we eat when we aren't hungry. If we've unrestricted access to food, for those of you who work at home, and you have a refrigerator that is not locked, you go to it all the time, all the time. We have access to Starbucks, or fast food, and we ourselves will tell ourselves, if I'm near food, if I smell it, if I see it, I won't be able to control myself. 
And then after all that, we'll eat more, even if we just ate. If it's around us, we'll still eat. For those of you that are eating, I'm not trying to point fingers. It's the church brought this to you. Don't be like, oh my goodness. I just want to show you, this is uh, something that I found on the internet. In 2022, U.S. is the best. We are the most obese country in the world. Probably in the history of the universe, we are the most obese country ever. Now, it's about 33%. Don't start looking to your left and right and saying, okay, it's one out of three. No, don't, don't do that. That's not the point of this. But the point is that this is a reality. This is why we don't like Lent, because we are so addicted to food. We are addicts. And if we have an addiction and someone says you're addicted and they tell you to stop, maybe you should listen, especially if they care about your benefit. You know, in the Orthodox Church, we talk about the vices. You know, there's the, the virtues, the love, the kindness, the mercy. Then there's the vices, the exact opposite. And there's about seven of them that they commonly list. Gluttony is almost always the first one listed. What is gluttony? We eat too much. We give our bodies whatever it desires almost whenever it wants, even during a talk about fasting. <laughs> I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the church provided it for you. It was a gift. <laughs> but the reason why it's listed as a vice. See, it's listed under vices. You want to know what vices are? They're not medical problems. Even though there are medical problems associated with what we eat, many of our medical problems are associated with what we eat, but this is a spiritual problem. These, these vices, gluttony, unchastity, avarice, which is love of money, anger, dejection, self-esteem, pride, these are spiritual problems, and gluttony is mentioned there. It's not, like I said, it's us always satisfying our desires uncontrollably. We're often enslaved. I know that I am. And it's a deep spiritual problem that we overlook. So let me ask you, what does Lent and Holy Week prepare us for? What, is, what does Holy Week and Lent prepare us for? It's not for this season of gluttony, which is the Holy 50 days. Oh, we're trying to control ourselves so that during the 50 days we can go back to gluttony. That's not the goal of Lent, but oftentimes that's the effect. The problem is, what is Lent and Holy Week preparing us for? Yes. You notice how Lent comes before the resurrection? They could have put Lent any time in the year, but they put it before the resurrection. It's focusing our efforts on the resurrection, the most joyful season of the church. The resurrection for a Christian should be everything. There's nothing more important to us than that we will resurrect. If we don't have resurrection, there's no hope for us. Why even bother? The Bible says that we're the most pitiful of all people if there is no resurrection. This is our focus. This is our, we're building up to the resurrection. That should be our greatest desire. As a church, the resurrection is what we believe. And as individuals, resurrection is what every one of us needs personally. Do you believe that you need a resurrection in your life? Do you feel a sense of deadness in certain things in your spiritual life? Then we need a resurrection, and that's what we're being prepared for. You know, when, we, when Holy Week comes, and we've made it through seven weeks of bean burritos and indigestion, what are we thinking of? How many hours until in and out and chocolate, right? We're thinking, after all that, when is in and out and chocolate? We're thinking back to, to food. We're not thinking of Christ's triumphant, glorious resurrection. It's sad. Fasting is necessary for us and our growth and our liberation and our transformation. I want to ask you, if Christ fasted before his ministry, 
the holy, sinless, perfect one fasted. He felt he needed to fast. If he needed to fast, how much more do you think we need to fast? Does anyone want to claim that we're better than him? Does anyone think that we're in a better position to fight our temptations without fasting than he was while fasting? If he needed it and he was perfect and sinless, how much more do we need this? I'm not saying, oh, just do it. No, we need it. It is so beneficial for us. Some of you are going to say, well, I've never changed from Lent. It never did anything for me. I'm sorry to hear that. But maybe this year could be different. Maybe something needs to change in the way we do Lent. Maybe we need a new perspective. And I hope everyone has had at least one Lent. I can remember mine. Maybe Uncle Albert and Tant Ruth remember when I went crazy. But it was the Lent of my senior year of high school that my life was changed. It, everything became so much more precious and real to me. I started to go on a different trajectory because of that Lent. That Lent changed my life. I hope that everyone here would have a Lent moment where they say, my life was never the same because that Lent, I drew closer to Christ and I had more of a change than in my entire life. That can be and should be your experience. So how do we do fast differently? I want to let you know, if you read Isaiah 58, that there are some fasts that are unacceptable. And we wonder why we don't change. He was telling them, so Isaiah 58, it's interesting. In verse 3 it says, the people are saying to God, why have we fasted? They say, you haven't seen. Like, we're fasted and there's no change. Well, why, are you, why aren't you paying attention to our fast? They're saying, God, I want results. You want to know what God is saying? I want results too. I want you to change your lives. I don't care if you're sad. And I don't care if you're stopping eating. What I want is for you to change. He says, this is not the fast that I've chosen. The one that I've chosen is to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. He says, I don't care about your sadness and the food. I care about a changed life, a desire to follow the commandments. So if that's what an unacceptable fast is, I found some definitions of an acceptable fast. It said, let us fast with a fast pleasing to the Lord. And I put in parentheses, not pleasing to me. We're trying to find the most comfortable way to fast. But we're trying to fast for God. We're offering a fast to God. So should it be pleasing? It's like saying, I want the most comfortable, enjoyable liturgy worship experience. I want to have nice cushions on the pews. I want to have beautiful... No, it's not. If we're offering worship to God, it should be pleasing to, to God. If we're offering a fast, then it should be pleasing to, to God. So let's look at an acceptable fast. The casting off of evil, the controlling of the tongue, the cutting off of anger... The cessation of lusts, evil talking, lies, and cursing. The stopping of these, the stopping of these is the fast which is true and acceptable. Another thing that I found it says the season of Great Lent is the time of preparation for the feast of the resurrection of Christ. So why are we doing Lent? To be prepared for the resurrection. We don't think about the resurrection until the day of the resurrection. But that's the goal from now. From now the goal is a resurrection. It's the living symbol of man's entire life. The symbol of our entire life is our resurrection to be filled in his own resurrection from the dead with Christ. It's a time of renewed devotion, of prayer, fasting, almsgiving. It's a time of repentance, renewal of our minds, hearts, and deeds. In conformity with Christ. What does it mean in conformity with Christ? To be like His. To conform to Christ's mind, heart, and deeds. It's the time most of all, it's the time most of all, our return of the great commandments of loving God and our neighbors. This is the time where we love God and we love our neighbors the most. So let's talk about the goal, the true goal of Lent. It says, the purification of our lives. Who does not need purity? 
I think we all need purity from something, one way or another. If I were, if you don't believe me, let's take your exa- your thoughts, let's put them on a DVD and show everyone. You know, well, let me purify a few things first. Let me take the things in your heart. Do we need purity? Absolutely. Our intentions, our desires, our speech, our things that we see and the things that we, do we need it? Absolutely. He says the goal is purification of our lives the liberation of our souls and our bodies from sin, strengthening of our human powers of love for God, strengthening of our powers to love God better, the enlightening of our entire being for communion with the Blessed Trinity. It says this was the true goal of Lent. You want to know nowhere in here, in this description, does it mention eight weeks anywhere. It doesn't mention the goal of Lent is for eight weeks to do this. You want to know, we're focusing on changing for a season. And that's the problem. We're only trying to make it through a season, and we always go back to where we were before Lent. Why don't we focus on a changed life? A life that after Lent looks completely different than life before Lent. Purity, liberation, increased love for God, following His commandments, loving God and our loving neighbors. If this isn't the goal of our lives, I want to ask you a serious question. Why be Christian? Why? If that's not the goal, to be in greater communion, to be more pure, to be liberated, to be freed, to be more obedient to God and loving Him more, why be Christian? But that's the goal of what we're trying to do. Now, I'm going to say something might be a little bit uh, unacceptable to some, but I mean this, and I want you to know this. You might be upset, but many, and again, like I said, many of you already are, the focus of Lent should be about losing weight. Got it? The focus of Lent should be about losing weight. Go tell the priests, go tell the bishops, and if they have a problem with it, have them come talk to me. Okay, don't do that, please. But if you're going to say it, you've got to say it in context. I want you to focus on (laughs) there's actually different kinds of weight. A lot of time we think about Lent, about losing the first picture. Not that this group is part of that statistic that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, I know that doesn't apply to this group anyway. But it's the second one. This, this is a, it didn't come out because I'm going to read it to you. And if you really want to look in your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. I, th- it just hit me this week when I found out yesterday that I'm giving the talk today. It hit me yesterday. <laughs> um, I want you to read Hebrews 12, 1 through 4 with me. And this is going to be my practical advice for Lent. Not mine. It's the book of, the, it's the Bible telling us. So I'm going to read it for you. It says, Therefore... We also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Mark didn't say it, the Bible did. Okay? And the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Despising the shame, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It says, Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. In those four verses... We have five points. So I want you, if you ever want to refocus Lent, Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 4. Number one, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. If you look at all the holy people, I mean, St. Paul says, I bring my body into subjection. When he talks about all his sufferings, in 2 Corinthians 11, he says, in fastings, Often. He says, often I fasted. Obviously, Jesus Christ is our ultimate example. St. Paul, Pope Krolos, was an amazing faster. He lived on bread, just bread, for certain parts of his lifetime. 
Amba Braam, who we love, he was a great faster. He would fast for so many hours and eat very little food. Queen Anna Simone. Do you guys know who Queen Anna Simone is? She was literally a queen. She was going to be the queen. She was the princess and she was going to be the queen. She escaped. She became like a hermit. Her story is amazing. She ended up becoming the leader of the Suwah. The leader of the Suwah, this lady who was a queen. You have to read her story. She was living in the forest, drinking out of the water pools next to the animals. She was eating the food of the animals. Everyone who made it very far, guess what? They were great fasters. And I want you to realize, they fasted physically and spiritually. You're not going to be on a more difficult path than anyone else. Your fasting is not more difficult than anyone else's. It's actually the road that the cloud of witnesses that we have, our churches surrounded by, they've all done it. So don't focus on yourself, but look at them and say, you know what, I would love to be like them. Number two, so, so be encouraged. If you want the life of holiness, follow their path. Number two, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. We're supposed to lay aside the weights that are trapping us. What if every Lent, every Lent, for the rest of your lives, may God give you long lives, that you were to shed the weight of one sin? If every Lent you got rid of one sin, I know some of you would live to be 950 and still be far off, but <laughs> it would be good. Find the sin that is trapping you and that is blocking your relationship with God. A lot of times we say, I'm going to be totally changed if you changed one sin a year. But find the heaviest one. Find the heaviest one and focus on that one. That needs to be your goal. This requires a great examination. Many of us already know. It's, it's very obvious what it is. That needs to be the one that you need to attack. If you could remove the shackles, the chains of that weight, wouldn't our resurrection our rising be so much easier if you didn't have a weight around you? I don't even want you to say, okay, I'm going to get rid of a weight. You have to write it down. You have to name it. Give it a name and say, this is my goal. This is the weight. It says, lay aside every weight. It's a commandment. Do it. Get rid of it. The one that blocks you. God willing, you will. And you need a plan. You need a guide, a, a, a counselor, someone that will guide you. But I got to tell you, that's why we have our spiritual fathers in the beginning of Lent say, the sin that I want to work on the most is this one. And so he will tailor a plan with you. And I want you to realize that if you don't have a goal, you won't achieve one. So if you don't have anything that you're aiming to improve on, guess what? You won't. So I want everyone, I'm giving you some homework. You're going to read Hebrews, what? And you're going to lay aside, you're going to write down the weight which you want to decide to remove. And I want you to realize fasting helps us in our fight against gluttony. Giving to the poor helps us in our fight against loving money. Praying helps us in our fight to rely, to rely on ourselves, our self-esteem and our pride. The fast is already giving you so many tools to accomplish the goal. Not an eight-week goal, a lifelong goal. For many of us, that weight, we know it in our heart, it's a grudge. It's an inability to forgive. It's an inability to draw close to one person. And that thing is blocking everything in your life. Or there's a thing that you did to someone that you've never regretted or never apologized or never asked for forgiveness for. And that might be the weight. You have to find it. Because if the rest of your spiritual life you're going to walk around with a weight, you're not going to grow as much. Number three. looking to Jesus, the founder and author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And this is what I want us to focus on. A lot of time during the Lent, what do we focus on? 
We focus on us. Oh, I'm suffering. I'm so hungry. And, and it becomes a pity party. That's not what Lent is. It's not about, oh, I'm suffering so much. Because, because what happens is that you start increasing yourself in your own eyes. And where's God? It's not about God. It's all about, it's all about me. The main goal of Lent is for us to look to Jesus Christ. Everything we do, all our hymns, all our readings, all our fasting, all our matanyas, it's about Jesus Christ. And the problem is that we look to our fast, but we don't look to His. Focus on His fast. He fasted for 40 days, a complete fast for 40 days. And then He was fought after 40 days at the weakest, at the time where His body would be the weakest. And we're looking at our fast? Well, what do we do? Uh, should we name a fast after your fast? Your fast is so amazing, we'll name a, a, a fast in the church because of your, your, your amazing... No. We always look at us, and then we say, oh, but I'm tithing, look at how much I gave. And you want to know, when we talk about tithing and giving, and we're looking at ourselves, look, look at what Jesus Christ did. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, did He give? No. He became poor. He didn't just give and remain rich. He became poor so that what? We who were poor could become rich. I don't care about your tithe when you look at Christ and you say, oh my gosh. He became poor for my sake. Okay, I'm going to tithe. I need to tithe. I need to give more as much as I can. Take everything because you did that for me. See, if you focus on Christ, you'll stop thinking about our little sacrifices and you look at his and you say, you deserve everything. You deserve my fast. You deserve my tithing. You deserve my prayer. You are totally worth it. So how do you focus on Jesus, looking unto him? I recommend reading the Gospels. Read the Gospels during Lent. Because the Gospels are about him. The reason we love him is because the story of the Gospels. It's how he would go and sit with the sinners or heal the blind man or accept a Samaritan woman. That love, compassion, kindness, mercy, how he wept when Lazarus died. Like, he has such care. When he saw the people, the feeding of the 5,000, says he looked to them as people without a shepherd. And he was like, it says he had compassion on them. The adulterous woman he forgave. The one who washed his feet. Like, that's the Jesus we love. That's what makes Lent beautiful. And if you do that, you know what? Lent could become an incredible love story. Lent should become an incredible love story if you focus on the one that you love. Because He showed us His love in this Lent, in His fast. And you want to know what it says? It was for the joy set before Him. For the joy set before Him. What was the joy set before Him that He endured the cross? What was that joy? It was you. The joy was you. He endured the cross. He's already shown His love for you. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? This should rekindle the love in our hearts. And I, I wanted you to realize this. Many of us at one time in our lives were extremely in love for God. We wanted to do anything. We wanted to give Him everything. We wanted to spend our time with Him. And then maybe He's telling you this. In Revelation it says, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You left your first love. Remember from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. I want you to think about that time, maybe you were younger, where you just wanted to be with him. What were you doing? What books were you reading? What prayers were you praying? What sacrifices were you making? And all of a sudden you find the love relationship is restored. I feel sad that much of what we do is out of obligation, el wagib, or obedience, or the commandments, but it's not out of love. But I really want you to focus not on your love. It says, why, the Bible says in 1 John, we love why? Because He first loved us. And if you forget His love for us, then you will probably not be able to love Him more. Or love him back. So number one, we're going to recognize the cloud of saints who have achieved high levels. We're going to aim on laying aside a weight. We're going to focus on Jesus. And, uh, sorry. For 
number four. It says, Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. There's a time in the Lent you're going to have trouble. You're going to be weary and you might be discouraged. He says, but consider him who endured such hostility from sinners. He endured way more. He says, we tend to think about what we're doing for him, but we forget what he bore for us and realize that on the cross, he suffered. He looked defeated on the cross. He stripped there naked. He was struck down hard. He stumbled under the weight of the cross. He endured such humility being naked. And you want to know what? After all that, he could have given up. He could have despaired. He could have been weary. But you know what? He won. He rose. He conquered the grave. He crushed Satan under his feet. So if you look at the beginning of the story when there's weariness and tiredness and labor, you're like, oh. But if you look at the end, the glory of the resurrection, that's us. Don't forget when we bear our cross, when does the resurrection come? After a death. After a death. So yeah, you could become weary and you could bear a lot. It's okay. Just realize that if you are carrying the cross with Christ, there's a resurrection with Christ, which is our goal. That's our goal. Don't throw away the cross before the resurrection. Accept the cross all the way to the resurrection and then experience your own. And last thing, in verse 4 it says, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. Are we supposed to do that? I mean, how much are we supposed to struggle against sin? Ah, it's too hard. Ah, I don't want to. Ah, it doesn't feel good. Do you guys know the story of the lady in the early centuries? She was in the Roman Colosseum, thrown to the lions, and the lions were attacking her body and they were chewing her up. And she noticed that her clothes was coming off and she was being revealed. While she was being eaten by the lions, she made more of an effort to cover her body to preserve her purity because she did not want to sin in exposing herself to the people while she was being eaten up. There's the story of a saint, a male saint, who was captured. His arms and legs were tied. Then they brought a harlot into him to cause sin with him. And he couldn't move his arms, he couldn't get his legs, he couldn't push her away. So what did he do? He bit his tongue till it bled so that he could spit on her to push her away. Yeah, some people have resisted the bloodshed against sin. How much have we struggled? It says you haven't done it yet. You need to fight harder against sin because we have this issue we have this desire to hold on to things that Jesus Christ tried so hard to remove. Why? He died. He, he strove to bloodshed for our sins. Are we willing to strive to bloodshed for our sins? Are we willing to fight? So I'm hoping that you will have gotten something out of Hebrews I'm convinced that if we have a new perspective of Lent with a goal to resurrect a new life, a new person, to bury the old person, to get the person that was chained by lusts and desires and selfishness and pride, to leave that one behind, to have a resurrection happening in our lives, a dying to the old self, a resurrection. Maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe we need to die to our old selves. Maybe we'll experience a resurrection. Maybe, like I said, I wish everyone to have that experience of the Lent that changed your lives. And so I say, seize the Lent. This is our time. Embrace it. Enjoy it. Grow close to Christ. Let this be your love story. Let Lent 2023 be your love story. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Our dear Master and our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself completely for us, I thank you that you held nothing back. I honor you and glorify you for giving so much for us. Nobody else would have wanted to save us. It's rare 
that someone would die for a godly person, but you died for ungodly people. You died for us while we were sinners, and you embraced us, you accepted us, you called to us, you reach out to us, and you're wanting us to come close. Dear Lord, we've had bad experiences. We've had weaknesses. We're full of failures. We are sinners. I confess, dear Lord, we're sinners. We're weak. We need your grace. We need an abundant grace. We need your spirit to work mightily within us. Help us, O oh Lord, to fight against our flesh and to live according to the spirit. I pray, dear Lord, that everyone standing here bowing their heads before you who has a desire but doesn't know how to move forward, I pray that you would give them grace. Let this be the Lent that changes our lives. Dear Lord, we can't do it without you. We put our fast in your hands. Unite our fast to your fast. Unite our sufferings and our sacrifices to yours. Even though ours are nothing, but you can make them acceptable and perfect before the Father. We thank you for your kindness and for this season and for this church and for this community where we all grow together. Hear us and have mercy on us and accept our prayers. The intercession of St. Mary and the blessings of the Holy Lent and for all the witnesses who have gone before us and demonstrated a holy life, hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Enjoy your lens.